Good afternoon and welcome to the Midday News on 3FM. My name is Beatrice Edu. The news is also live on Kesme, 107.1 FM and across the world at 3news.com. Coming up in the next 30 minutes. Inter-party advisory committee under auspices of electoral commission meeting to deliberate on the commission's timetable ahead of this year's general election. Also, National Democratic uh, National Executive Committee of Main Opposition Party NDC will be meeting to deliberate on the running mates proposed by the party's flag bearer John Mahama. Also this afternoon, concerns emerge over what some say is the unending issue by President Akofuado to rewrite Ghana's political history. We have details for you. Thank you very much for joining us. Let's start off from here where there are concerns this afternoon about unending desire by the president-led uh, government to rewrite the country's history. The last seven years has seen some key national monuments undergo name changes with holidays also renamed and new ones announced. Let's run you through some of the proposals and the changes that have been made by President Akofuado. Renaming of facilities, the Flagstaff House to Jubilee House. UPSA renamed Nanopoku and Puma University of Professional Studies. Also, UDS Navrongo Campus renamed CK Tedem University for technical and applied sciences. While UDS campus renamed SD Dumbo University of Business and Integrated Development Studies. Tamale Stadium renamed Ali Muhammad Sports Stadium. Hall Technical University renamed Ephraim Amon Technical University. University of Education Weneba at Kumase Campus renamed Akentinga Piaminka University of Skills, Training and Entrepreneurial Development. Now other changes that have come on January 7 declared Constitution Day, August 4 declared Founders Day, and September 21 renamed Kwame Nkrumah Memorial Day. The latest attempt at renaming a facility has caused the overlord of the Dagban, Yana Abubakar Mahama II, to urge President Akufuado to reconsider his decision to rename the Tamale International Airport as Yakubutali International Airport. The Yana Abubakar II says that the Gbewa Palace has been inundated with calls and other forms of communications, pleading that this proposal be shelved. Uh, Professor Ebenezer Ayensu is a political historian. He joins us live on the line. Good afternoon to you, sir. Thank you for joining us. Hello. Hello. Professor Ayensu, can you hear us? Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Hello. Hello, I can hear you perfectly well. Good thank, afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm sure you've been following the discussion as regards the renaming of facilities by the president and the reactions coming in. Of course, with the latest coming from the Dagban chief, what can you tell us in terms of your uh, your own uh, thinking of what's happening? Uh, in, in the, thank you very much. Uh, are you hearing me? Yes, I can. Please go ahead. Yes. In the first place, when I listen to the list that you presented, I think there's a need for you to um, uh, make ca specific categories for us to be able to go through. Having said that, um, the Tamale Airport, uh, the issue being raised by the Dabon Overlord, it's a genuine one in his estimation or in the estimation of some other people. They think uh, different persons should be named after the facility. So it's a genuine concern. But then we should also go into the mind of the president and find out why his choice. And I think it's informed by the level of work the presidency and under his watch went through to get the facility and having gotten it uh, he might be of the view 
You might be of the view that he should name it after a personality whose maybe influence played a, a greater role in getting that or getting what the, the region had got into at the point. That's what I can think of. So, but if you look at, well, let's take uh, UPSC, the history of UPSC is that it was a private person who founded the school and who, unfortunately, under the era of killing Ghanaian initiatives, that facility was taken. I don't think he was compensated. I don't think he was given even the chance to defend himself, whatever. So at the end of the day, I give it right that is named after that person or someone closely associated with it. If you go to the Winnipeg Kumasi campus, what is Kumasi campus? The university, the, the unit is not being given an autonomous status. And if you are doing this, obviously it needs to have an identity and therefore a name. So generally we have to be very um, objective in discussing some of these things, but we stop personalizing it. That's what I will see. So listening to the explanation you've given uh, to us, uh, do I get the understanding from you that probably Ghanaians are overreacting to the actions of the president or probably he's also doing it too much? Well, uh, both. Some, and I wouldn't say Ghanaians. There are a few who have an agenda, and that's the agenda they pursue. That this man, whatever you do, we take it from the other angle. So it would be wrong to say Ghanaians in general. There are a few who are interested in that for obvious reasons. And the president also might also think that I'm in charge. I have initiated various policy moves to get what uh, the facility or the unit has gotten to, and therefore I have to make, name it. If we take the Tamale um, airport, I will concede that some measure of conversation should have taken place. Left to me, I would have named the airport after the president himself. Or most of the things he's doing in the dog, left to me, I would name it after him. That, won't, won't that worsen the situation? Because already you're saying that people are criticizing him for obvious reasons. And I actually wanted to find out from you what those obvious reasons are, as you know obvious them. Reasons, political, and I've, I've been giving you, I'm giving you that left to me. I'm not a northerner. I've lived in the north before. My father worked in Boku. We lived in Wa. And the state of the, the, that area, compared to what is happening now under the uh, uh, Kufuado's watch, I, I want us uh, to end. Mm, I, I want us to. Uh, go ahead. I want us to end our conversation, and I wanted to find out from you what, for you, should be the way forward. I know you've spoken about uh, broad consultations, as it were, but in addition to that, really, how you think we should handle this issue? I, I, I hope you are not putting words in my mouth. I, I'm talking specifically about the Kamali Airport that I said you should have spoken to the the king to address objections. That that is it. That, but there are so many other things that we may complain about, of this naming thing, which I think we are overdoing it. We should know that this is where it was, this is where it has reached, and this is how these things that I have, even uh, if I'm not going to name it after myself, there are some distinguished individuals. Take the Kumasi campus you talked about. Apia Menka. What is wrong about naming an institution after Pia Menka? So forgive me, uh, just because of time, you think that the president deserves to name those institutions after whoever he thinks sh he, those institutions so should represent, and those individuals yeah. also should be given the credits they deserve. That's what you're saying in summary? Yeah, I, I think so. Thank you very much. We'll have to end it here. Professor Ebenezer Yensu, he is a political historian. Thank you for speaking to us. Let's get a quick reaction from a security analyst, Adib Sani. Good afternoon to you, sir. Thank you for joining us. Pleasure is mine. Mr. Sani, you might have heard the political analyst uh, giving specific uh, attention to the Tamale airport, as it were. And I, I believe that that's also one of your concerns as well. How do you interpret what's going on and how you believe we can handle it? 
Well, it, it is a normal thing to do across the world. I mean, even in highly developed countries, you see libraries named after individuals, streets, etc. People who have excelled and improved the lives of other people or made impacts on society. And I find it rather curious how fixated this government is in naming. I mean, it's, it's just uh, too much. And but but that is not what really the issue. It's for me. I am absolutely shocked that such a naming would happen without due consultation. I think the most important person to have consulted would have been the Yana, because he represents that bomb. You, you get me? And I'm shocked to the very core that such a thing would happen without him knowing. So what I'm thinking that is that let's put it on hold. I'm not saying we should change it to another name or do this or do that. But what I'm saying is we need more stakeholder engagement to perhaps get them to understand what really the issues are and also get to listen to their menacing concerns. And hopefully we can have a consensus about the naming, okay? But for now, it's quite obvious that no due consultation was, was done. And that, I must say, is unfortunate. But the fact that the Jana is now talking to it means he's talking for the whole of that one. That's what it means, because he is the overlord. There's no accident that he's called the overlord of the area. And if nothing is done about his concerns, one thing is for sure, we are bound to face some level of resistance. Some level of um, resistance. To what, yes. to what level do you foresee this in terms of security threats? Because mind you, airport is also a security zone. Yes, absolutely. In fact, it is uh, within even a military zone, zone in the area, okay? But what I'm thinking is um, we might have this issue dividing Dagbo. You, you hear me? We might have some people okay with it, others not okay with it, and it might unearth old wounds. And I think we don't need that at this particular um, point in time. That is why I... I'm suggesting, as a son of Dagba myself, that the president puts that one on hold and engages the stakeholders on the ground, particularly the Yana. We'll have to end it here. Thank you very much, Adib Sani. He's a security analyst. Thank you for sharing those views with us. Now, the Interparty Advisory Committee, under the auspices of the Electoral Commission, is this afternoon meeting to deliberate on the Commission's timetable ahead of this year's general election. In exactly nine months, millions of Ghanaians will head to the polls to elect a new president and 276 members of Parliament. The polls will be Ghana's ninth successive general election since the the return to constitutional rule in 1993. The EC this week released the electoral calendar ahead of the December 7 polls. We'll be engaging uh, my colleague who is monitoring the Interparty Advisory Committee IPAC meeting shortly. But first, let me take you through activities planned by the Electoral Commission ahead of the December 7 uh, general election as announced earlier. Reminding you, April 1 to May 26, 2024 will be public education on voters registration exercise. May 7 to May 27, voters registration exercise. July 9 to 18th of July, submission of provisional voters register to political parties. Uh, from the 15th of July to the 24th of that same month, exhibition of voters register. August 30 to September 5, final voters register to be submitted to political parties. Now, from the, 7th, uh, from the 9th of September to the 13th, the EC will receive nominations for presidential and parliamentary elections. 23rd of September, balloting for presidential candidate. The next day will be balloting for parliamentary candidate. December 2, special voting for special, uh, selected professionals. Uh, and December 7, the election day. Duke Pokumensa is there. He joins us live. Uh, Duke, what can you report from where you are? Which is, I can tell you that all the interested political parties, MPP, NDC, CPP, among others, are all in this crucial IPAC meeting, essentially trying to tweak the Electoral Commission's calendar to a much more acceptable and an agreeable form for the political parties, so that later today at 4 p.m. at a press briefing at the EC's corporate office, um, this electoral calendar will be outdoors to the entire nation to know um, how the Electoral Commission is going to proceed with its electoral uh, 
um, uh, program or calendar for this year's crucial election. The NDC um, has indicated that there are certain clear key gaps in this calendar which they would want to be changed or they would want to be tweaked or they would want some form of um, a different arrangement to be agreed upon when it comes to this rollout. So they are canvassing this position. Also, um, at the last IPAC meeting, the latter part of January, the Electoral Commission um, uh, did uh, the major item for discussion at the IPAC meeting was whether the Electoral Commission should stick to its decision to uh, run the election in December or move it to November um, as he had agreed upon later. There were some divisions or disagreements, as it were, uh, as to what position the Electoral Commission should take or what would be taken going forward. Subsequently, the Commission has indicated, or uh, in some media interviews, that they would be sticking to the December 7th uh, polls, uh, the December 7th date for the polls. Also, the use of a deliberate ink has become quite a, a, a matter of serious political contention among the political parties as whether to use it or not. The Electoral Commission favoring not using it. But we are told that that decision has also been gone back upon. So it will, all these issues will be discussed. Uh, and then later, we'll get a full briefing from the Electoral Commissioner herself at 4 p.m. at the Electoral Commission's corporate office. Duke, before you go, listening to uh, the, the submissions made by the parties earlier, particularly NDC, and what's happening today, can we assume that after 4 p.m. when the EC comes to us, we should have had all these issues resolved, and after this, we should say that we are ready for the polls ahead? Well, yeah, that's the essence of IPAC. I mean, it's a place of consensus building. It's a place of uh, concessions and being able to get onto an agreeable position for the political parties. So I'm sure with the position that the NDC is canvassing, if you should find favor with the other political parties and the arbitrator, that's the Electoral Commission, uh, they'll come to some sort of a conclusion. Thank you very much, Duke Opoku Mensa, uh, joining us live uh, from the, that IPAC meeting uh, happening uh, currently. We'll have full details from 4 p.m. later today. We stay on politics because the flag bearer of the position, National Democratic Congress, John Mahama, is this afternoon justifying his choice of a running mate before the party's Council of Elders and national executives in order to complete his ticket for the December general election. John Mahama is per the party's constitution expected to nominate in firming up processes for the elections. Even before the announcement is made, however, there are strong suggestions the 2020 running mate, Professor Nana Jane Opokwajiman, would be named again for the 2024 general election. The National Executive Council and the Council of Elders of the party are holding separate meetings this afternoon to deliberate on the nomination. Let's look at her again and her background, uh, Professor Jaina Opoku Ajiman, and uh, her four, uh, four professor of literature. She's 72 years old. Some of her political achievements, a first female running mate of the two major political parties in Ghana, selected as the uh, presidential running mate for the National Democratic Congress on July 6, 2020, for Ghana's December 2020 general election. Uh, academic achievements, first female vice chancellor of the University of Cape Coast, chancellor of the Women's University in Africa. Let's take you to East Lake on this afternoon, where my colleague Armstrong Gold Alaba is monitoring the meeting of the National Council of Elders of the NDC. He joins us live as well. Armstrong, uh, the party leadership uh, has anyone arrived yet, and what can you tell us from what you've seen? Which is certainly so. As I speak to you right now, you can see all those that matters to this meeting. They've got it already. Unfortunately, the media, we have been kept outside uh, since this is an in-house meeting. This is a cross meeting where the media is not supposed to uh, be in there. Currently, we are gathered outside here. I say we, we from the media side. And of course, in general, we've been here since morning trying to monitor those coming in and out, and I can say confidently to you that GM, uh, we are told, is in there. Uh, there was a vehicle that came in, and we suspect that that was him, and we could see a couple of other vehicles, of course. Vehicles speaking politicians are all packed here. Uh, as you are told, the meeting has already commenced, and uh, very soon, in about an hour or two, they will come out and uh, inform us who exactly they have agreed on to partner John Dramani Mahama in the 2024 general election. As it sounds right now, we are told the meeting has commenced, and in no time, they'll get back to us.
Thank you very much, Armstrong Gold Alogba, reporting live from that meeting of the NDC uh, senior executives that you're still here on the Midday News on 3FM. My name is Beatrice. The stories we brought you so far, Inter-Party Advisory Committee and uh, auspices of EC meeting to deliberate on the Commission's timetable ahead of this year's general election. You also just heard some details there of the National Executive Committee of the NDC meeting to uh, finalise a uh, decision on who becomes the running mate for John Mahama. When we come back, we'll bring you some stories on what's happening with our maternal mortality. Stay with us. Freezer, technology. I go for freezer, ba. We ain't going. And once you open your fifteen letters, you want few gum. What's here? You want few gum. What the boss here? If you get beer, you want to get beer. You have got to sell. You want to make money. Then we show sir. We make sure it's tasty. Then we make sure it's fun. No, no, freezer. We don't pay enough for the freezer. That's here. A bus on the show, man. I'm on the edge. I'm not me. Me what's it? I'm not me. Me do me. Me do me. Me do me. Me do me. Adama, what that Adama? No, kuya. Adama. You can't resist. Benya Adama West Africa for a dream, you will be buried a tongue cry on a dream. I say, Kayuna can kind of enjoy a dream. You're so here on the Midday News on 3FM. Thank you so much for staying. Now, maternal mortality continues to increase in the Ashanti region in spite of efforts to reduce it to the barest minimum. Over 200 women died from pregnancy-related complications between January and December 2023 in the region alone. The Sustainable Development Goal 3.1 targets the reduction of maternal mortality to less than 70 per 100,000 live births by 2030. But with only six years left, can Ghana achieve the target? Consider Considering the country's current maternal mortality, Ibrahim Abubakar is our man in the Shanti region. He joins us live now. Ibrahim, the numbers we're hearing obviously uh, or seem alarming. Uh, can you tell us more about this? Well, this is very, very scary um, because um, health authorities are very much concerned with the numbers. Um, 2023 alone, or between January and December, the region recorded 260 cases of women losing their lives due to pregnancy-related complications. And this is not something um, they are happy about. In fact, when you take Ghana, we are currently doing around 300 um, lots of life per 100,000 livelihood. And like we rightly mentioned, uh, for the SDG, they are targeting less than 50, uh, 70 per 100,000 livelihood and it, keep, it it appears the figure keeps increasing and one of the reasons that health authorities have attributed here is um, because of the saw in projects for many health facilities you move to many health facilities and you realize that the maternal and child health facility uh, um, work on it has stalled so um, that is the issue and they are calling on authorities to make sure that um, they complete most of the abandoned hospital projects in the Ashanti region so that they will be able to enhance care when it comes to maternal and child health units. I engage with the Ashanti Regional um, Health Director, Dr. Emmanuel Sinkwan. The challenge of Ashanti region is that of maternal mortality. Women dying from pregnancy and pregnancy-related causes. Unfortunately, last year, we lost close to 216 women from pregnancy-related complications. But I believe that when we get all these facilities completed and then strengthen the referral system, then we can reduce this number of women who are dying. And more importantly, when we get a confinoche and then all these facilities completed, it will be, it will be very good for Ashanti region. So I'm ha very happy that the king has taken the initiative uh, to get involved and I believe that uh, this is going to help so that we can get all these projects completed for the people of Ghana. You heard the, the Ashanti Regional Health Director, Dr. Emmanuel Tinkwang. Uh, Abubakar is still on the line with us to uh, wrap up our conversation. Abubakar, we know one of the challenges in that region is health infrastructure deficit. Beyond that, what else have they been saying as regards what's contributing to this challenge? 
Now, apart from that, um, one thing they have also identified to be um, a major factor is the low acceptance of family planning. Um, when you come to the region, the acceptor rate is very, very low. And according to health officials, this is also contributing to uh, maternal and child health mortality. And now what they intend to do is to increase advocacy on people um, so that they will, they will accept family planning and that, then they can make a headway when it comes to um, reducing to the barest minimum maternal and child health. Thank you very much, Ibrahim Abubakar. He's a man in the Shanti region. Thank you for bringing us those details. Now let's head to the Western region where Irama Smith reports that the See Something, Say Something campaign by the Ministry of National Security is facing a big challenge of prank calls by children. She joins us live now. Irama, quite disturbing there, but uh, tell us what more campaigners are saying. Right, so you... We we'll remember or recall that um, this campaign was started about two years back and um, they've been to some administrative capitals across uh, the country. They tell us they, are, they intend to sit in all the administrative capitals. So um, the Western region is the southern that they are visiting. And since they came, they've been visiting, they've visited the regional coordinating council, that's the regional minister and some traditional um, leaders. And now the coordinator um, disclosed that one of their major challenges since they launched the campaign is um, prank calls by children. And these calls usually come in um, between um, 3 to 4 p.m. on weekdays. So, you know, that is the time that usually uh, these children would have closed from school because they, they do this um, um, education in some of the schools. The children take down the toll-free number, the 999, and then after school they just make the calls. And usually when they call, they will be requesting for either um, um, credits or candies or, you know, very, very unimportant things. And she was saying it is very important that parents educate the children that their lines should be used only in emergencies because a child using the line at any particular moment could block someone who needs help from using it. So um, she drew attention to this and ask that we all help support the program to be successful. What about the security of uh, whistleblowers? Uh, did that come up? Yes, it did come up. You will also realize that when it comes to Ghana, um, most people are pathetic to um, issues that they think may land them in trouble. When they see uh, something going askew, they would rather stay away. Um, than, and especially when they have to deal with the security services. Just see, some, uh, see something, say something, encourages us to contact the security persons if we don't use the toll-free number of 999. But unfortunately, she indicated there are some um, security personnel who do not have integrity and become whistleblowers in there. Usually would alert um, the, 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 the culprit to whoever went to make the report, putting them in, um, at risk. So she said they have also identified this and any person who comes in, into contact with any uh, such situation should immediately alert them. Still using the 999 and the IGP is ready to do decisively with any security person caught doing such a thing. So the safest is to just use the 999. You heard right there, Irama Smith, who is our Western Regional Correspondent, bringing us those details. And that's how we end the news here on 3FM. Our top stories, IPARC meeting currently underway. We understand we'll get details after 4 p.m. Also, National Executive Committee of NDC meeting as well to decide on who becomes the running mate for John Mahama. We brought you updates on maternal mortality, particularly in the Ashanti region. My name is Beatrice Sedu. Thank you very much for joining us today. Log on to 3news.com for more news. Coming up next is Business Daily. Paco Siasari is here.
Sacra gets busy on this frequency. 92.7, 3FM. Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to Business Daily. My name is Park Asari. Coming up this hour, Ghana's balance of trade surplus declined by $240 million in 2023 from that of 2022 as a result of a decrease in cocoa and oil exports. Also coming up, AGI urges Ghana's central bank to manage public expectations regarding city depreciation. So what it is now, it's not the time to panic. I think it's fine. Uh, of course, it's not the best. Anytime the city depreciates, it has serious implication on businesses. An economist describes finance ministry's letter to the president cautioning him of the financial implications of signing the LGBTQ bill into law as blackmail. To escalate it, to say that this money will not come, that money will not come, this money will not come, and we total it and say this is so much money that will not come when we go ahead to sign the bill. I consider that to be a black bill. These are many stories coming up uh, shortly. In our first story, Ghana's balance of trade surplus declined to $2.63 billion in 2023 from $2.87 billion in 2022, according to the Bank of Ghana's January uh, 2024 monetary policy report. The decline is mainly due to decrease in cocoa and oil exports, resulting from lower production levels of the two important export commodities. Ghana's trade surplus narrowed in 2023, according to data released by the country's central bank. The surplus reached $2.63 billion, down from $2.87 billion in 2022. This decrease is attributed to a decline in export earnings, which fell by 4.9% to $16.64 billion. The main driver behind the decline in exports was a decrease in crude oil and cocoa product shipments. Crude oil exports dropped by 29.3% to $3.84 billion due to lower production volumes and prices. Cocoa exports also fell by 8.4% to $2.11 billion, primarily due to lower production. However, gold exports increased by 15% to $7.6 billion. This rise was driven by higher volumes of gold production, particularly from small-scale mining companies, and an increase in gold prices. Import figures also saw a decline in 2023, falling by 4.2% to about $14 billion. This decrease was observed in both non-oil and oil imports. Oil and gas imports, mainly refined petroleum, dropped by 3.3% to $4.48 billion compared to 2022. Non-oil imports also dipped by 4.6% to $9.54 billion. An analysis of non-oil imports by category revealed a decrease in capital and intermediate goods, while consumption goods saw an increase. Capital goods imports decreased by 16% to $1.74 billion and intermediate goods fell by 1.5% to about $5 billion. In contrast, consumption goods witnessed a 13.2% rise to $2.18 billion. Notably, imports of other goods, mainly passenger vehicles, significantly declined by 34.7% to $590.54 million. 
And that was a three business news desk report. The Association of Ghana Industries, AGI, is urging the central bank to manage public expectations uh, regarding the recent depreciation of the local currency to prevent panic. AGI Chief Executive Officer Seth Chumakwaba says the current depreciation against major trading currencies is within normal trends but warns it could worsen if the central bank fails to effectively manage public expectations. The city has depreciated nearly 6% against the dollar since since January 1, 2024, uh, currently trading above 13 cities to the dollar. Normally, the concern we have is that once you start uh, panicking uh, and speculating, then people begin to hurt the dollars uh, or a foreign exchange, and then it creates even worsening situation for the city. So when you see a bit of plummeting or a, a, a bit of um, decline, uh, it's not a time to panic. I think, I think that we should trust our economic management to manage it. And of course, Bank of Ghana has a key role to play. The interventions are key to be sure that we don't allow that significant drop in the, in the, in the, in the, in the city, in the exchange rate. So what it is now, it's not a time to panic. I think it's fine. Uh, of course, it's not the best. Anytime the city depreciates, it has serious implication on businesses. And that's what you would like to avoid as much as possible. Seth Chuma Kwaba is a chief executive officer of the Association of Ghana Industries. Now, economist and dean of the UCC Business School, Professor John Gachi, has described the finance ministry's letter to the president cautioning him of the financial implications of signing the LGBTQ bill into law as blackmail. The statement highlighted concerns that Ghana could lose over $3 billion from the World Bank if the bill becomes law. However, Professor Gachi argued that the Bretton Woods institutions cannot penalize Ghana and consequently withdraw financial assistance to the country based on factors such as passing a law against LGBTQ+. Well, I think those issues do not arise in the first place. Remember, we have engaged with the IMF and there was no condition regarding LGBT. We have engaged with the World Bank, there was no condition regarding LGBT. So, why do we get these things that we are discussing? Of course, uh, the, the, the management of World Bank, the IMF, have some concern about whether or not we are giving uh, enough protection to the LGBT community. That is their concern. So to escalate it, to say that this money will not come, that money will not come, this money will not come, and we total it and say this is so much money that will not come when we go ahead to sign the bill, I consider that to be a blackmail. I consider that to be the, uh, the, 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 the Minister of Finance doing lobbying uh, for the LGBT community, which shouldn't happen. Professor Gachi further argued that the international conventions prohibit the Bretton Woods institutions against using LGBTQ to restrict support for members. Again, there is international convention uh, that um, the, uh, the Global um, Human Rights Council has also indicated that, look, while uh, focusing on protection of uh, minority rights, you shouldn't use that to uh, as a weapon against countries who come for development finance and who come for assistance for which they are going to repay in any way. So the World Bank has not written to Ghana uh, that we are we are about to withdraw the, the the agreement that we signed and we are giving you money. And the Minister of Finance goes ahead to say that this is what is going to happen. I consider that to be a lobbying activity and it's not in the interest of the country. You heard the voice of the Dean of UCC Business School, Professor John Gachi. That'll be all uh, for Business Daily. To end the news, a quick reminder of our top headline stories. Ghana's balance of trade surplus declined by $240 million in 2023 from that of 2022 as a result of a decrease in cocoa and oil exports. Also, AGI urges Ghana's central bank to manage public expectations regarding city depreciation. And as you just heard, the economist describes finance ministry's letter to the president cautioning him of the financial implications of signing the anti-LGBTQ bill into law as blackmail. For more news, do also visit our website. It's www.3news.com.